Hey everyone, and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be talking about anime episodes 153 through 155, which will be covering manga chapters 237 to 241. And we have finally arrived at the start of the Skypea arc. Now, this arc is sometimes looked down upon by the fans, at least from what I can tell. There seems to even be a portion of the fans that seem to hate Skypea and consider it pointless and overly long and boring. And some even advocate for like new watchers or readers to even outright skip it, which I'm here to adamantly say do not, under any circumstances, skip this arc. I personally think Skypea is really fun and a great arc. I mean, it adds so much to the world of One Piece and. Things that have lasting effects on the rest of the story, from smaller things that are not as inconsequential to large impacts to the overall story, even to this day, to where, you know, current day chapter like 1023. And while it's still a mystery to us, even where, you know, even at the current Wano arc, where some of these story threads even end up in, from that start from Skypea, it just seems like they have a way larger impact on the mystery of the world of One Piece at large. So, yeah. I repeat, do not skip Skypea. And one other thing before we get into the actual episode is I think one thing you'll notice in these episodes is while it's kind of been a gradual transition, but by this point you see kind of a greater shift in the art direction and animation style as the characters are drawn a bit thinner with much sharper edges and straighter lines. It's always stood out to me a lot in, in the characters here at the beginning of this arc. And this is also where we pretty much have shifted almost entirely away from Fat Chopper. To the more cuter, thin chopper that we have today. And so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of like, I don't know, point that out because, yeah, it always stood out to me. But with that, let's get into the synopsis. So, the Straw Hats successfully make it up the knock up stream into the world of the clouds and reach Skypea. Immediately, they run into many dangers and friendlies as well of the Sky Islands. However, in order to gain entry, they're asked to pay an entrance fee by this old lady. But they elect not to pay, which will come back to have some dire consequences later. But after they land, they run into a couple of welcoming inhabitants of Skypea who generously offer them their home and some food, as well as information about Skypea and the Skypean way of life, including the knowledge of an all knowing and all powerful god that presides over all of Skypea. All right, let's jump into the differences. So, there are a couple differences. I think one of the big ones, well, not really, it's not really that big actually, but it's just one that always stood out to me is during that funny scene where Usopp and Luffy are playing with the tone dial and Luffy calls him an idiot and then he plays it back. But so in the anime, you see Usopp in the background kind of just sliding behind him. He's like, after Luffy, Luffy goes, Usopp, ah, hold on. And then you hear Usopp go, nande, nande, nande. And he's just repeating that back and forth. In the, in the manga, it's not, it's the same thing happens, but it's not quite as funny because Usopp just says, Nandea once and just kind of like it's just that one panel he doesn't keep repeating it and so when when Usopp is is sliding behind him and repeating that it's just much funnier in the anime and I think it is than it is in the manga so kudos to Toei for that one but yeah that whole scene is just hilarious where <laughs> Luffy's like Usopp <laughs> and then Usopp's just like Nandea 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 <laughs> It's so funny. I don't know why. Now, a slightly bigger change is much later on where we see those uh, mysterious four guys hunting that one desperate guy in the upper yard. So there's an extra scene with NL's underlings chasing that random guy in the forest where they have him cornered. In the manga originally, it goes from the point where right where they corner the guy to that gorilla warrior immediately firing his bazooka on, on them then straight to the scene where the guy begging Nami to to take him away and you know save him and then we get NL blasting his big ass like light column down on on the guy and then it, that's kind of how that scene goes and then but the short conversation of the dog guy and the bird guy challenging each other is not in the manga so there's that what would have originally been before the guerrilla warriors fired the bazooka there's that short scene that part is not in the manga so instead there's also a cutaway during this scene to luffy grabbing their salvaged waiver from earlier and then you know him drowning with it and then having pagaya take a, taking a look at it so that whole sequence 
for the most part, is not in the manga. In the original scene, which happens much later, just before the White Berets appear, it's just a small panel of Pagaya looking at the old waver while Luffy is looking at him. But Luffy never actually drowns, and Zoro and Chopper never try and save him. And so that whole sequence is gone. And then the last little added scene is where Usopp and Chopper are making the cloud sculptures and then Sanji getting pissed and kicking them down. This kind of mirroring the scene from Drum Island where Luffy and Usopp are making the uh, the snow people, like the snow queen and the um, the hyper Yuki Daru-san. And then Sanji again getting annoyed at that and kicking those down as well. So it's kind of mirroring that scene a little bit. That pretty much wraps it up for the differences. So let's get into the episodes themselves. So the Straw Hats make it to the Sky Island, and they did it. They're floating on the clouds, which is pretty insane to think about when you when you see, you know, consider where the series started. I never imagined that there would be a whole arc dedicated to an island up in the skies. So this is a really cool development. But yeah, Luffy's simple-minded outlook of the situation, is essentially accepting whatever he's seeing as sound logic, will never not be funny, as he matter-of-factly states, of course we're floating on the clouds. <laughs> And this cascade of jokes as Usopp needing CPR and Sanji excitingly declaring he's going to give Nami CPR and then the camera pulling back to show Zoro calling him an idiot. Like all this entire in, like introduction to Skypiea is freaking hilarious. And of course this just adds to that sort of running joke of Sanji, you know, acting like an idiot and then Zoro just offhandedly calling him an idiot. <laughs> it's never not going to get old. I feel like it happens almost every arc now. But Usopp eventually regains consciousness in the next scene and, and overconfidently decides to dive into the cloud sea, which always seemed weird to me how willing he is to be the first to dive in, given how scared he is of everything. And you'd think, t you know, an unknown body of water in the sky, no less, would be pretty scary in and of itself. I mean, I don't even like regular water, much less a body of water in the sky. So I always thought this was a bit out of character for Usopp, but I guess the only other character they could really have to do this particular story point would be Luffy, but given his devil fruit nature, he wasn't going to be going in there. So I think Oda, I'm sure, needed somebody to go down to there to show the characters and us how the Cloud Sea worked and to show us that there was no sea floor and kind of establish that and so I think he just kind of made Usopp do that but it is a bit out of character in my opinion but yeah as they as they wait for Usopp to resurface he doesn't and eventually Robin you know per her sort of dark morbid uh, character trait Robin just floats out this morbid idea that there probably isn't a sea floor and then everybody eventually comes to the conclusion that Usopp may have actually fallen through because <laughs> he's not resurfacing and then in desperation, Luffy launches his arm into the clouds, but he can't see where to aim. Then we get a really cool scene where Robin actually, again, showcases her abilities in action. As we learn that she can sprout literally any part of her body, including her eyes, with her ojos fleur ability and Luffy's outstretched arm, you know, both of those in tandem help to locate Usopp as she discovers Usopp has indeed fallen through the cloud sea, but is able to rescue him by chaining her arms together to grab him and again i like what is taking as many opportunities to really highlight robin and her usefulness as well as her role in the crew ever since she joined since we didn't get a real proper build-up like other crew members she was an antagonist for the most of the time that they knew her and so there wasn't really much interplay between her and the crew like the other members got before they actually joined so it's nice that he's kind of working that in and sort of establishing Robin again as as a legitimate member of the crew. However, in dragging Uso back up, he attracts some giant cloud sea monsters, but Zoro and Sanji make quick work of them, but they're visibly out of breath and exhausted after they beat these things, which makes sense given the extreme elevation they're at now, and the air's probably really thin, so their bodies are just aren't used to it, and also the actual trip up seemed to be pretty taxing even for the monster trio like Luffy and Zoro and Sanji were seen visibly like exhausted after that trip up the knockup stream along with everybody else and then this time in another hilarious scene Usopp regains consciousness again but this time because now there's like a sky fish in his pants <laughs> wiggling around and Robin looks at and deduces this fish is probably the same fish that Nolan's log 
had mentioned. And while they're talking about the evolutionary biology of the sea life in the clouds, Luffy just grabs the, sh the fish and just runs off screen. And then in the next frame, we see the fish sauteed by Sanji and Nami screaming at them. We're still investigating that. And in the midst of yelling at, at the, the pair, Nami tries some of the fish and also abruptly changes her tune from scolding to happy praise that the fish is really delicious. Like this entire scene is just so tonally all over the place, but it's so funny. But kind of getting back to the fish, though, one thing you've got to really hand it to uh, Oda is how much extra thought he puts into his world. And you can really see it with these sea creatures because he's th clearly thought about the evolutionary change of these animals and how they've evolved to be flatter, lighter, and more balloon-like to be able to survive up in the clouds. And it's never explicitly stated, but I know he has to have even thought about like how they got there whether these animals were native to the Sky Islands or whether they were unfortunate creatures thrust up into the sky from the knock-up stream and forced to evolve to survive up there now. But yeah, it's all really fascinating and, and it's it's crazy to think that he's put this much thought. But again, it's like kind of just, just one real scene here that, that actually affects anything. But it's this attention to detail that makes One Piece so fun to watch and read. So in the next scene, in the distance, Chopper notices a ship and is being blown to bits by this one person. Then that person races towards them on what looks like skates that allow him to glide across the sea cloud and then immediately attacks the Straw Hats and shockingly makes quick work of the monster trio and one-shots all three of them. Obviously, this is a result of them still weakened from the trip up and the thin oxygen levels. But yeah, it's it's pretty shocking to see the Monster Trio just get completely manhandled like this. And it does a good job of just kind of selling us on the dangers of Skypiea and what awaits them. With the trio knocked down, just as the masked attacker is about to fire on what looks like a bazooka at the Going Merry, another guy in, in knight armor comes out of nowhere on a huge bird to save them, calling himself the Sky Knight. And this is, as we learn later, is Gunfall. And I love Gunfall. And fun fact, he is voiced by another Dragon Ball Z alum, uh, Yo Yoji Yanami, who voices the narrator, as well as King Kai and Dr. Briefs in Dragon Ball Z. But also, we've actually heard him in One Piece before. He is Boodle from Orange Town, and he is the mayor of Orange Town. So yeah, it's cool to have him back because he's got a really cool voice. He brings this sort of nobility to Gonfall that really works really well for the character. But before I get ahead of myself, he offers them a whistle for protection for a Sky Island currency called Extol. But no one knows what the heck he's talking about, and he assumes they would have learned what Extols were from entering through a place called the Summit of, of High West. But Nami interrupts him and asks him if there was another way to get, it, get to the Sky Island. And to Nami's dismay, there was a much safer and normal way to get there. And I always laugh, laugh at Nami's like sadness here. As she turns to the camera and just cries. And not only that, but we also learn that there are other Sky Islands too, not just Skypea. But to their credit though, Gamfo also explains that going up the safer route could have cost more in terms of their crew. Because generally when you go up that safer route, it seems to cost those crews people. And so... The knock-up stream, while it is a high risk, there is a high reward as well because you either all get there or none of you get there. So there's not sort of this sort of culling of crew members as would happen if you had gone through the high west. But I, it's never really made clear as to what happens and why you start losing crew members when you go up this way. And for that, Gunfall praises their guts and skills to get up the knock-up stream. So he gifts them one of the whistles instead of charging them and to call him if they ever need him for one time only as he leaves he reveals his name is gunfall and introduces his pet pierre who is a bird that has eaten a devil fruit the umama no mi or the horse horse fruit and this has got to be one of the most gut busting reveals of the arc pierre transforming into, into his hybrid form is set up to be this awesome reveal of a pegasus type of animal but then it reveals to be this ugly, goofy, unmajestic looking animal. And the, and the way the music just peers out is so funny too. I mean, Pierre as the horse is so ugly because he, <laughs> he's he got this like goofy look on his face. And then he still keeps that really god awful, ugly, like pink 
pattern and so he just looks gross but i love pierre pierre is freaking awesome with that they eventually make their way to a place called heaven's gate where an old angel lady named amazon takes their pictures and asks their purpose for their visit as well as asking them to pay an insane amount of money for an entrance fee to get into skypea and of course none of them want to pay this like exorbitant amount of money and she eventually just lets them pass without payment. But you know this is going to come back to bite them some way later down the line. And we will get to that. They then get transported to the magical island of Skypea via a giant shrimp or lobster. I can't remember which one it was. We've now arrived at the place where the map is actually pointed to that they found on that big ass galleon ship earlier. Once they make landfall, they most of them just jump right off the boat and start having fun. But of course, Nami and Zoro are the ones to first make sure that the Mary is all right and that they've anchored before venturing off, fulfilling their usual secondary captain duties because Luffy is just, you know, too much of a kid to just <laughs> to do his job. But interestingly enough, new added to this new dynamic is now Robin, who is also a bit of a more mature presence as she's now the oldest member of the crew. So she's definitely has some experience in terms of staying safe and staying alive and even on that note there is one moment that caught my eye was with robin's little comment to zoro about how she never even thought of landing on an island as the start of an adventure which conveys sadly so much about her character like and her past she's lived a life of nothing but survival and never even considered how fun traveling and landing in a new unknown land could be and it's pretty heartbreaking when you think about it but also really heartwarming that she's now found a place where she can begin to feel a little bit more freedom and, and a little bit more joy in, in sort of life. And it's, yeah, it's a very bittersweet moment in, in terms of like character development for, for Robin. After a bit of fun messing around on the beach, we're introduced to a Skypean girl named Konis and her cute little fox, Sue. And Sue is so cute. Oh. In addition, not too long after, we are also introduced to her father, Pagaya. They then proceed to explain to us and the crew about the various aspects of Sky Island life, the culture, the technology of Skypea, and sort of the architecture of it as well. We get this short-running joke about how Skypeans greet each other with the word heso, which is actually Japanese for belly button. <laughs> so it just sounds stupid to Luffy and most Japanese audiences when, when they greet each other with heso. And Luffy points this out every time going forward, how weird it is. One thing I wanted to mention here about this whole beach sequence is, is I think one thing that kind of gets lost in the anime is kind of the beauty of this scene and how like well drawn it is in the manga in terms of just sort of conveying like how beautiful Skypea is right off the get-go. Because in the anime, the camera has to keep darting back and forth to each character in these really plain looking, almost blank backgrounds where it's just the characters heads or their bodies and you don't really see much in the background whereas in the manga because they can create still images but have multiple things going on at the same time and then even dialogue can just be overlaid on top of it with you know word bubbles obviously and so you get these like really wide and beautiful shots of the beach and you know you have many characters doing things all at once like you have that scene with Nami stretching then you have like Luffy and Usopp kind of messing around in the background Zoro is still slowly walking towards the beach from the water and you get these like really wide shots and they look really cool but it's kind of lost in the in the anime because it doesn't have time to do those shots and so it has to really focus in on each character whenever they say something and so it's kind of disappointing but I get that it's a necessary evil Later on, we get a little bit more world building as we learn the different types of clouds that they use up there. Some that are really hard, which are used to build their structures and, and their things, as well as like watery clouds and various densities in between that sort of make up all the materials they use to, whether they, you know, build appliances, furniture, buildings, their roads. It's all made of clouds, it seems. And interestingly enough, we learn that the special sky clouds that are formed, they're due to volcanoes on the regular sea floor back on Earth. And they, the volcanoes release these like special 
sea prism stones or kairoseki particles that seem to float up into the sky and sort of merge with the moisture vapors to form these hard, hard clouds. I'm not sure if this will play into anything later, but it is an interesting detail and world building that Oda has actually introduced that seems kind of random. And, you know, I'll be honest, I don't know where this actually plays into because I've never seen this bit of information actually paid off in any way. At least, maybe I'm forgetting something, but I, I don't re recall this ever actually being paid off yet. So it may be something way further down the line. But yeah, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that one, because I can't seem to remember. However, obviously the most interesting new concepts that are introduced in Skypiea are the dials and wavers. Wavers are like these jet skis that are powered by a special shell called the dials that can shoot out bursts of air. And Nami is immediately interested in the wavers and takes one out for a spin after Luffy tries it out and fails miserably and almost drowns. Oh, we get another running joke of Chopper trying to jump in and save Luffy, but then needing to be saved himself by Zoro because he's a devil's fruit user as well. And so, of course, Nami is a natural at this and goes off on her own ride for a while. And while this happens, the others head to Konis and Pagaya's place to enjoy a meal. And here we learn more about the dials. And these things are cool. We see that pretty much the entirety of their technology is built around these dials. And there are different types of dials for all sorts of different uses. There are tone dials that record and play sounds. Flame dials for, well, flames and heat. The breath dials are the ones that blow air, which is what's attached to the wavers. And a bunch of other ones like light dials and all that stuff. And this is really cool, as we're seeing a culture that has a way of life and technology completely new and different from anything we've seen in the past. And it's just really interesting, like basically picking up a fantasy novel or movie and learning all about how it works. I mean, he essentially just like created a new world inside of a new world he's already created, which is insane, like how much thought had to go in to, to do this. And it's even unlike anything we've seen in One Piece, and we've seen a lot of weird shit in One Piece so far. And then this is where we get that one scene that I mentioned in the differences section, which is one of the funnier jokes in the series, is when Luffy records himself in the tone dial, calling Usopp an idiot, and then Usopp complaining behind him, going, Nande, 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 or why, why, why? Then Luffy plays it back, and Luffy, shocked at the shell, is making fun of Usopp when it's in fact himself. And then gets a, I mean, this, this whole scene just gets a laugh out of me because like Luffy is genuinely shocked that <laughs> he's like, the shell just made fun of Muso. <laughs> but yeah, I laugh at this scene every single time. There's also a, a, a pretty funny detail here. Like right when Konya starts to explain what the dials are, Zoro originally starts off pretty interested in what the dials are. But about halfway through, it cuts to him and you see him passed out asleep from boredom. <laughs> like it's very Zoro, but it's just kind of like shows you the capacity of like Zoro's like interest in, in sort of these technical things. He's a very simple person, much like Luffy, but not quite as stupid. <laughs> but his his like attention span is just almost on par with Luffy, but he just falls asleep instead of just rapidly moving on to a different point of interest. And then we get another funny moment, <laughs> which I also really like, is when Sanji and Pagaya are preparing lunch and Sanji tries this random thing in Pagaya's fridge and it clearly tastes awful, but being the being a chef, you know, Sanji tries not to judge different cultures and different tastes, and he tries to act all professional and respectful, saying, ooh, man, I've never tasted anything like this, and then Pagli awkwardly has to tell Sanji that it was actually food that's gone bad. <laughs> Sanji is just like, don't keep things like this, and just throws it on the ground. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love, I love these jokes. I, you know, it's, I miss these sort of in-between type of, of jokes where you have like these quieter moments between the ramp up to an, an arc or the ramp down from a, the ending of an arc. It's just, yeah, these jokes, I miss them. Anyways, however, during lunch, Sanji and the crew begin to wonder if Nami is all right, as it's been a while now as she, since she's gone out on the waiver. And Konis begins to worry and hopes that Nami hasn't gone to a place called the Upper Yard. She goes on to explain to the rest of the crew that it's a sacred land not to be approached, otherwise they could face the wrath of God Enel. 
as he seemingly has the ability to know exactly what is going on in all of Skypiea at any time, hence his sort of god labeling. Now this is interesting because we now have clearly somebody who instills fear in his citizens. And at this point, we don't even know if this is an actual godlike being or if this is sort of someone with an incredibly powerful devil fruit or somebody playing a trick on them a la wizard of oz type of situation but it is interesting now that we have a quote-unquote god that the crew have to now face so it'll be fun to see how they actually go about interacting with this god nl oh and one thing i wanted to mention is the translation for god nl so in the Crunchyroll translations, as well as a few other places that I've seen, translate his name as Eneru. While this isn't technically incorrect, as that is the romanization and pronunciation of the Japanese name, but in this case, it should be pronounced Enel. And the reason for this is that, so in Japanese, there is, there's no L sound really. So it's often done using the R sound. And that's where you get that funny yet inc incredibly racist depictions of like English, like hero, and, and or this like the indistinction between like a Japanese person saying lice or rice sounds exactly the same. And it just sounds like nice. Like when you say lice, it's just lice. But anyways, so when it's said in Japanese, that L sound is replaced with the ru sound. But when it's translated, it should be NL. So that's what I'm going to be saying for the rest of the the time of this podcast as I'm going to call him Eno and he should be called Eno but with that little side tangent out of the way getting back to the story of course Nami stumbles onto the upper yard which is mysteriously and curiously made of actual rock and soil it looks like and not clouds which is weird to see and this probably plays a role in why it's considered sacred as it's something that Skypeans don't seem to really have much of it's also weird how this is even here or how it even got here because it clearly seems to belong on the ground. In addition, Luffy hearing that this place is forbidden, obviously true to his character, it motivates Luffy to want to go explore this place even more, even with threat of a god. And yeah, when we cut back to Nami, we see just how dangerous this place can be. As Nami witnesses some random guy being hunted by these four strange yet strong looking dudes, and then behind her is that same gorilla warrior that attacked them earlier, approaching Nami. But the way the gorilla warrior just utters the name Enel sort of antagonistically makes it seem like he's not with Enel. And so there seems to be sort of multiple factions of people. And you get the feeling that he's separate from those four guys hunting that man. And you see that these probably are going to be the primary underling antagonists. We get a really weird, creepy, rounded-looking guy, and then two cool-looking dudes. One on a giant bird, like Gunfall, but way more menacing-looking. And by far my favorite one so far is the one that's got the sunglasses with an oversized regular dog. Like, it's not even really some fearsome-looking, like, wolf-like dog, like Fenrir or something. It's literally just a normal dog, just scaled up in size. <laughs> Like, that's Oda humor for you right there. There's also a fourth guy that we really don't see or hear much of. We get to see him from the back, and he's got this, like, weird, like, spiky hair look going. But we'd, he only utters, like, a couple lines, and we don't actually see his face, only his eyes. They seem to be working for God NL and are his underlings who basically dole out punishment for those who don't pay the entrance fee or violate any laws. And so these are most likely going to be sort of the commanders that the Strong Hats will uh, need to face eventually. At least that's the sense you get from seeing this scene and given how, you know, built up they are in terms of like their strength. The desperately hunted man is cornered by his pursuers and eventually tries to plead with Nami but then also resorts to threatening her. I forgot to mention this, but right before that scene, the gorilla warrior actually fires upon the... The four guys, the four underlings of NL. So it's made very clear at this point that he is against them. So now there's a third faction, apparently. But after the hunted man starts to threaten Nami, all of a sudden the sky turns really bright and a giant sudden column of light crashes down from the sky in front of Nami, killing the man. And this scene is insane. And just shows what kind of power we're dealing with as God Enel just completely obliterates this guy in a small chunk of the island with this like massive building sized column of light. At this point, we don't really know what the heck his power is. 
if it's a devil fruit or some kind of a weapon, but it's crazy how it appears out of nowhere and how much destructive power it has. I mean, I, you can pretty much deduce what kind of power he has at this point. At least I did when I first read this, but just in case people don't want to be spoiled, I'm not going to mention it and wait for the actual reveal. But, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Nami quickly hides and then listens to the conversation between the four underlings, and she deduces that this man was being hunted because he entered the island illegally without paying the entrance fee, and now fears the same fate is awaiting her and the rest of the crew. So she races back to warn the others. Meanwhile, the crew is approached by some sort of a police force of Skypea called the White Berets, led by a man named Captain McKinley, who has come to reprimand them of their illegal entry. And that is where the episode ends. So there we have it, the start of the Skypea arc. And I think the Skypea arc gets a bad rap because compared to the recent highs of the epic Alabasta saga, Skypea seems much smaller in scale, very insular to the overall story, so it doesn't seem nearly as good as Alabasta, which it isn't, but it certainly does not mean Skypea is not good or, not, or worth watching. I, like I said, it should not be skipped as it's immensely entertaining and important to the story in my opinion. I've always liked Skypea, and I think as more time has gone on, as the significance of Skypea becomes more and more clear as time goes on, I like it even more. But even when I originally read this you know, saga and arc, I really enjoyed it because it's got some really like cool epic moments and some really funny lines. Like I think that's one thing that gets lost about Skypea is just how funny it is. Like the whole arc is funny. You know, and I don't want to spoil it, but obviously you get one of the most famous memes on the internet because of this arc. But anyways, we'll we'll get to all of that as we go through the Skypea arc. But yeah, if you did enjoy this, send me a like or a comment. If you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Also, you can check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Sunnygo Podcast for updates as well as when I post new episodes. And you can stay tuned for some spoiler discussion. It's not really going to be a discussion more so than just me pointing out how and why Skypea I think is important based on using examples of spoiler material and how it relates back to Skypea. But yeah, as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to listen to my podcast and I hope to see you on the next episode. Bye. Alrighty, so spoilers. This section is obviously going to be largely unscripted. But yeah, I just wanted to sort of note why Skypea is so important because when you really think about it, it relates back to a lot of important things, big and small. I mean, first of all, the dials, they play a big role in Usopp's growth and his strength. Like you see Usopp incorporating the dials into his arsenal and you see how strong he gets. He basically can fight Luffy. I mean, obviously he's going to lose, but that battle versus Luffy was largely somewhat effective because of his use of the dials and how he incorporates the dials into his new weapon, the Kabuto, make, making it stronger is what allows him to save Robin when, when she's about to be taken to the gates of justice. And, you know, it's funny because, like, the dials are hugely important. And one of my favorite scenes is Usopp using the impact dial on Luffy's face. Like, that scene is so freaking cool to see Usopp just nailing Luffy. I mean, it's a scene that you'll never, you would have never imagined you'd see, but it's what allows Usopp to somewhat put up a fight against Luffy. And similarly, kind of on a smaller scale, what led up to that fight was Usopp losing all that gold and money that they got from Skypea to Frankie. And that that's the catalyst for their sort of breakdown in their relationship for Water 7. And then on another related note, we get the introduction of the Club Outer Man. I think that's how you pronounce it. But yeah, the sort of that spirit that comes in sort of like a dreamlike state for Usopp as he sees the Club Outer Man repairing the Going Merry. And the, obviously this gets explained later on by Frankie and by Iceberg about how this is basically Mary's will trying to repair itself so that she can safely guide them back down to the world. And you miss that and you sort of see what happens later and it doesn't have the same impact. 
And then we also get the information that Roger was actually up in Skypea and he knows how to write. Well, he did, himself didn't know how to write. We find out that it was Odin that wrote the uh, inscriptions onto the Poneglyph about how he was there. But it also gives us more information about the Poneglyphs in general, as well as the reveal of the Poseidon weapon, setting up the whole Fishman Island arc, as well as Shirahoshi being Poseidon. And that whole storyline gets set up as well. Oh, and there's still more, too. We get the introduction to Mantra being basically the first example of hockey and observation hockey. And so we get, I mean, that's a huge staple of the fighting mechanics now in One Piece. And this is like the first example and introduction of it through the use of Mantra from Isa and NL. And speaking of NL, I have to think that NL will also return and play a bigger role eventually based on his cover story that which we'll cover later on where he goes to the moon and meets these like moon people and in like this sort of creates this army of androids and whatnot but this has to be something big and more significant especially with the reveal that the latest chapter in 1023 where it's revealed that there's a race of people called the lunarians which king may be a part of and now you start to connect like all these dots of like lunarians and moon people like there's, there's got to be some sort of a connection like i'm not really a theorist or anything like that but it's clear to me that there's it's setting up something and based on the cover story for nl th there's no way that that does not play a role later on in the story now even where i'm at in chapter 1023 this isn't very clear as to like how it'll fit in but you you gotta think that it's, it's gonna play another role so you know not knowing who nl is is a pretty big deal if you skip skypea and then again there's this whole theory going around with the reveal of the sun god referenced in the wano arc and in skypea this is the first mention of a quote-unquote sun god in the nolan kalgara flashback that we get during the skypea arc now again we don't know what, how this will actually tie back in but you gotta think like the that's that can't be a coincidence like the, you know so all these story threads are still being set up from skypea and more and more as we get further into the story it seems like things are relating back to skypea more and more and more and so, yeah, I don't think Skypea should be ever skipped. Actually, I mean, no arc should ever be skipped in One Piece, to be quite honest. At least any of the canon arcs. I don't care what you do with the fillers. But any of the canon arcs should be paid attention to. And I mean, we get like smaller references to Sky Island stuff too. And like we see that one of the supernovas, Uruj, is a Sky Island resident. And so he's got the wings and everything. And so you're introduced to Uruj and you're like, okay, so he's a sky person, whatever. But I mean, that holds some sort of a significance as well as the fact that we see Nami training on another sky island with Aria during her two-year time skip. And so we get a lot of these references to sky islands that are completely lost if you sk skip Skypea. So word to the wise. Although if you're listening to the spoiler section, you probably already have seen Skypea, so at least I hope so. So I'm not really advising any of you, but just kind of like relaying the importance of Skypea. But yeah, just in case there are a small percentage of you that have gotten all the way to Wano and then not read Skypea, I would definitely recommend go ba going back and reading it because it's it's a good read. Like it's a good read and it's important. But anyways, thank you for listening and I will see you on the next episode. Bye.